Well, good morning, everyone. Sorry for the lateness. What are we, four minutes late? Oh, I should be taken out back. Uh, okay, so um, I, I would blame Josh because Josh was having a quick meeting with me. We're getting some work done here at the church. Uh, what's happening at the church? We, we are getting hot water. I know it sounds weird. It's, it's an older building, but we're getting hot water put into the uh, bathrooms here. Um, for some reason, we haven't had hot water for a long time, so we're getting a guy to trench in a gas line, and and uh, bingo, bango, we're going to have hot water probably by Sunday. So anyways, um, that's why we're just making sure all of our tradies are um, hooked up. So today we're going to continue on with Russell Moore's book, The Storm-Tossed Family, and I'm really enjoying this chapter on marriage and the roles of marriage and how we are a cross-shaped marriage as well. Um, he, let's just, he was, I love that he's talking a lot about covenant. Um, huge um, props to my pastor that trained me, mentored me, Mike Oshiro. He really uh, helped me understand the value, better the importance, uh, the primary importance of um, speaking about covenant, not only in marriage, but also how we do membership at church. Um, we, we need to use covenantal language versus contractual language. So we live in a culture now where contracts can be broken, like your cell phone contract can be broken in an instant and you can switch companies. So our connectivity to contract is so, it's, it's very loose, it's very thin. But if we start using language of covenant, everything should change. Now, for a lot of people, they don't. It's a new language. That's a, a new diction. People don't know what that vernacular means, and so Russell Moore talks about that in the in the context of marriage. Let's keep reading. With covenant, most come with connection. Love, biblically defined, is both active and affectional. In Jesus' parable of what it means to love neighbor, the Samaritan is moved with compassion. He feels when he sees the beaten man on the side of the road, and at the same time, he actively serves him. Christ loved his church, but loved in an active way by giving himself up for her. A dry sense of objectivity in terms of our redemption would lead us to a cold, cerebral sort of faith that can easily become transactional. We stand by what God has done for us objectively in Christ, but we also live out a newness of life, a faith that works itself out in love, in life. A faith that is as Christ himself dwells in us in love. So we are in Christ from the moment of our redemption. But we also grow up into Christ over the long period of a lifetime of sanctification. Marriage pictures a one flesh union that like the gospel itself is both legal and and relational, both objective and subjective, both covenantal and connective. Our vows to one another mean that we are objectively one flesh union. Our intimacy in marriage, though, means that we grow into that one flesh union by coming to live in harmony with one another. Intimacy like fidelity, is harder than it seems. Sometimes people are dismissive altogether of romantic love and companionship as a basis of marriage. Some who object to what they deem to be traditional notions of marriage will make the case that love in marriage, the way most of us would define it, is a modern innovation. 
Those who speak of a biblical definition of marriage, some would say, are speaking of an economic agreement or an arrangement designed to navigate relations between relatives or to provide financial security. Marriage, in this view, was an economic and political arrangement, not a matter of personal or romantic love, a matter more of acquiring in-laws than an acquiring of a spouse. In one sense, this is quite true. Many cultures around the world have, even now, marriages that are arranged by parents, sometimes with large dowries required, such as such as what we see in ancient world or, or the, the culture of the Bible. Certainly, sometimes these arranged marriages are loveless and transactional. But often they are instead filled with genuine affection and tenderness, and even romance. One simply cannot make the case that romantic love is entirely absent from the biblical witness to marriage. Even if one did not accept the authority of Genesis, which I do, one would nonetheless know that this is an ancient document that would have had to make sense in some way to its readers. In this account, the union of Adam and Eve is not simply economic, but also tender and affectionate. Adam seems to exalt when he sees the woman as at long last bones of my bones and flesh on my flesh. And know, for instance, Jacob's pursuit of Rachel, in which upon meeting her, he kissed Rachel and wept aloud. If all that Jacob was seeking were his father's goats, he could as just easily have received these through the marriage with Leah. Yet, he worked seven years in order to marry Rachel. And he loved Rachel more than Leah. Genesis 29, 30. This sense of love and as a feeling of personal affection is seen also in the erotic celebrations of the Song of Solomon. Marital love is not, biblically speaking, merely an economic arrangement, even when it is arranged by families. Those who speak of the relative newness of love as defied by romance and companionship are quite right, though, when they speak of the value romantic love has in our culture. Not just for marriage, but for one's sense of oneself as fulfilled and even whole. These, this deification of romance can be deadly to both fidelity and to, and, and to intimacy, to covenant and to connection. And here is why. The power of sin and destruction is never in the creation of something entirely new, but in the misuse or twisting of something God created to be good. The passionate and affectionate longing of love is no exception. The critics of Marriage for Love are quite right that the project seems to have failed giving skyrocketing divorce rates and infidelity and cohabitation. But I would argue that what has changed is not a move from arranged marriage to marriage for love, but rather our very definition of love, which we have indeed, as one observer notes, idealized and thus overburdened the institution of marriage beyond what it can bear. God designed us to leave mother and father and to cleave to one another in order to become one flesh. In some ways, this transition is a traumatic as, as birth. We leave behind familiar and step into a new world, one in which we are responsible for one another. In God's plan, part of the reason we do so is because of the overwhelming drive toward one another. 
manifesting itself in hormonal haze of early love. In this stage, the couple wants to be together, just the two of them, for, the, for endless amounts of time. They could talk on the telephone with each other for 12 hours if they could find the time. Then they could stand on a pier and kiss until the sun comes up. They baby talk with each other about how they feel about each other. This surge of romantic affection feels really good. The problem comes not with any of that, but only when we assume that this is, in fact, what, quote, love is. This is easy to do in a society where popular culture reinforces this notion. Popular culture is, after all, driven by advertising, and advertising is driven by youth. Commercial markets don't want to sell toothpaste to a 50-year-old man. A 50-year-old man already has his toothpaste brand. And apart from some major you know, life disruptor, will probably keep using the familiar for the rest of his life. The corporations want to sell toothpaste instead to future 50-year-olds to lock down the pre preference in years before those preferences have concretized. This is the opposite of what typically happens with, say, political advertising, which tends, with some exceptions, to target older tastes and inclinations. The reason for this is obvious. Old people vote, and young people don't tend to do so in large numbers. Popular culture, though, seeks to mirror their experiences back to the target demographic. The most seemingly transcendent of these experiences is the feeling of love. When, though this is presented only in adolescent terms, one is less likely to recognize love when it deepens and matures. Often when I find young men who express frustration in finding a mate, I can trace their struggles back to this phenomenon. They are seeking someone to, quote, complete them in every way. Someone who can meet every physical, emotional, and mental need for them. In the pursuit of this, some young people find those who can excite them with novelty and unpredictability, but not in ways that are sustainable over a long term of a marriage that will be filled in every case somewhere and with difficulty and pain, not to mention the everydayness of establishing a household. I once knew a young man who wanted to be married and actually have many in inviable options, but consistently found himself pursuing women who would end up hurting him. I told him one day that I thought the problem was that he was looking for a 25-year-old woman when he should be looking for a 75-year-old woman. It became clear to me because he thought I was recommending some bizarre elder fetish. I did not, of course, mean that he should marry a woman who was literally 50 years older than he. I meant that he was evaluating potential mates only with the present in mind how hot she is, or how fun or how does she seem, or how accomplished is she at work. Preparing for marriage, however, means preparing to seek someone who can love and be loved throughout the long haul of life together. The wise path, the wise path would be to choose a mate that one can imagine not only lying in bed on a honeymoon, but kneeling by a bedside at a hospice. Such a covenantal view of the whole sweep of life, of belonging to one another through everything, is the only way to bring real joy. Hmm. You'll put on weight, you'll see your hair turn gray, like me, or fall out, you will sin and fall short of the glory of God. A covenantal view of marriage would show that you are not partners keeping score on your contract agreements, but you are one flesh, committed to love and to serve each other, not because of what you can get out of it, 
but because you simply belong to each other. It's such an important thing to teach, not, not only for our next generation, but this idea of the ideal of what love is being generated and fabricated in some advertising campaign from America or for wherever it is, of what is the ideal of the, the romantic comedy that we see pumping out of Hollywood every year and how we, we pursue it almost with bl blindness to say that's it. I love what Russell Moore says here. To see your partner at the, at the bedside of your honeymoon and at the bedside at your hospice. Going through the ebbs and flows of the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's what marriage is really about. It's not a transactional equation of if I do one, two, and three, I always get four, five, and six. It's not about some equation that you, you a risk management equation. It's about, oh man, it's interesting. I remember my, my first roommate said this, my friend Tyler Nielsen. Oh, God love him. He's such a cool dude. He was getting married to Julie. I, mean, I remember asking him about his vows. And he kept on coming back to this one thing. Love is a choice. I don't know, it sounds trite, almost sounds simplistic, almost infantile. But it was the framing, better the core. Because God is love. And so, so like love is a choice. God is a choice every single day. And so he kind of unpacked it. Like every morning when I wake up and I see my wife, it's like love is a choice. Not to say that it was hard or whatever, but there are days. There are moments where you just want to... Just you just want to roll your husband under the bus, or you just want to like say, "Look, I'm done." Love's a choice. Jesus is a choice. The greatest thing about that, as we look at covenant, not contract, is that we may break our covenants, and that's what happens with infidelity and and moral failures. We're constantly breaking them. But God never has. He is immutable. He's unchangeable. His character is steadfast. So when you woke up this morning, God looked at you and you said, Morning, son. Morning, daughter. Ne it will never change. And we need to remember that. To the day you die, God is waiting for you. And God, his son Jesus, he knows you. He knows you by name. Well, good morning. Uh, hopefully you can go get your coffee. And um, it was such a good time uh, at church on Sunday. Thank you for all of you that came. It was so it was so much fun. Hopefully we'll have some more news from Jacinda Ardern today with how we're going to restructure our Sunday. It's, that seems what we're doing is we're always restructuring our Sundays. Um, I know parents, you're waiting for kids ministries to start and, 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 and thank you for being so gracious and kind to us as we try to figure all this stuff out. But uh, God bless you and God knows you and start your day that way. All right. Bye for now. We'll see you in the morning tomorrow.